All righty, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we're really excited to be talking about uh, an important Supreme Court case. So I'll first introduce myself, um, introduce our panel, and then I'll give a little background on the case before we get started with some of the questions. Uh, so I'm Jake Charles. I'm the executive director of the Center for Firearms Law at Duke Law School. Uh, the center started in late 2018, early 2019, and its goal is to build the field of firearms law and to serve as a reliable resource and to host events like this where we can talk publicly about the Second Amendment and firearms law in an atmosphere where we can lower the temperature a little bit on these kind of conversations. Uh, joining me on the panel today is Professor Mary McCord, who is a visiting professor of law at Georgetown Law School and the executive director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. Professor McCord was the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2016 to 2017, and the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for National Security from 2014 to 2016. Previously, Professor McCord was an Assistant U.S. Attorney for nearly 20 years at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. Among other positions, she served as a Deputy Chief in the Appellate Division, overseeing and arguing hundreds of cases in the U.S. and District of Columbia Court of Appeals and Chief of the Criminal Division, where she oversaw all criminal prosecutions in federal district court. As pertinent to our <clears throat> conversation today, Professor McCord filed an amicus brief in the Bruin case on behalf of former federal national security and law enforcement officials. Thank you for joining us, Professor McCord. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Joseph Bloker is the Lanty L. Smith 67 Professor of Law and Faculty Co-Director of the Center for Firearms Law at Duke Law School. Professor Bloker's principal academic interests include federal and state constitutional law, the First and Second Amendments, legal history, and property. His current scholarship addresses issues of gun rights and regulation, free speech, the law of the territories, and the relationship between law and violence. Professor Bloker also joined an amicus brief in the Bruin case filed on behalf of Second Amendment scholars. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, all right, so let me give a quick overview of the case that we'll be talking about. Uh, we're happy to talk more broadly about the Second Amendment and about what the Supreme Court's new intervention into the Second Amendment means. Uh, but the case that we're primarily talking about today is a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association against Bruin. Um, I'm, I'm sure that many of you for being here are familiar with the case, uh, but some quick facts about the case. It's a, a challenge to New York State's concealed carry licensing law, which requires proper cause for a person to get a concealed carry license. New York is one of about six or eight states total, depending on how you count, that have these type of laws that require a person to show something like good cause or reasonable cause or proper cause to get a concealed carry license and don't let just anyone who meets statutory criteria and passes a background check get a concealed carry permit. Uh, there are kind of two main issues in the case that are really important for the future of the Second Amendment. One is this question of whether or not this kind of law is constitutional. This is going to have a big effect because it influences uh, those six state other states, about a quarter of all Americans or 80 million people live in jurisdictions with these types of laws. So that first issue is really important. But also another issue that's really important is what the court is going to say about how lower courts should evaluate these types of claims. So the court might adopt a test that says contemporary costs and benefits, things like the empirical effectiveness of a law, really matter. Or it might adopt a test that says we look only to history. We look only backwards when we're dealing with gun regulations to decide whether they're constitutional. All right, with that overall um, uh, overall uh, overview of the case, um, I'm going to turn to some questions for the panelists. And I should say, we'll have a time at the end for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them down. Um, we'll have that time at the end. Um, and we're happy to talk about things, like I said, that are, that are broader than just this issue. Final last housekeeping point is that the, the conversation is going to be recorded today. So if you have concerns about that, uh, then if you don't raise your, question, your hand and ask a question, then you won't be um, on video. But if you, uh, if you do ask a question, it will be um, on video and it'll be up on our, our website at the law school. Um, all right, first question for both of you is just, uh, what was your general overall impression from the oral arguments? Mary, we'll start with you. Well, um, you know, I, I do think that the particular statute at issue in the case the, that you just described mm -hmm. with the requiring a proper cause, some sort of showing of a particularized need for a person to obtain a concealed carry license, I think that 
um, you know, it is at risk. I would say uh, there was uh, it, it, it vests a considerable amount of discretion in the licensing authority, um, <clears throat> and it's clear that that discretion is exercised differently across New York, particularly differently between rural areas and urban areas, which you know one could argue, and in fact, the solicitor general Barbara Underwood did argue sort of that that's a feature, not a bug. But one could argue the opposite that that leads to arbitrary and capricious uh, decision making. So I think that the particular statute is vulnerable, which means potentially vulnerable in these other states mm -hmm. that have similar um, uh, concealed carry licensing requirements. I did not get the sense, though, that um, the court would be inclined <coughs> to issue an expansive ruling that would really undercut or undermine validity, certainly of historically regulate, you know, historical regula regulations, longstanding regulations, as Justice Scalia put it in the Heller case back in, in 2008. I didn't get the sense that they even particularly would be I mean, there were a lot of questions about shall issue states, questions uh, propounded by, to both Paul Clement and Barbara Underwood, you know, and, and I actually can't remember if also to the government, but, you know, there seemed to be, at least among some of the skeptics of New York's statute, such as the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh, some, um, uh, and I'm going to put aside Thomas and Gorsuch for now, um, some interest in, you know, wouldn't this be, wouldn't this satisfy? And I, 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 for the most part, Paul Clement said, yes, that would mm -hmm. sort of satisfy our concerns. So I don't think we're going to see something that really, um, not that not that whatever they do won't lead to lots of litigation, because people are litigious, and th this is America, and that's what we do. But, but I don't think they're going to issue a ruling that is really expansive. Mm -hmm. And in an area that's of particular concern to, to me and, and my current work, which is I do a lot of focus on anti-paramilitary and anti-militia work. I don't really see any um, chance that a ruling would be so expansive as to say it's perfectly fine for private militias to take up arms, either in opposition to the government or in augmentation of government authority. But we can get into some of that later mm -hmm. if you're interested. So those are a few initial thoughts. Terrific, thanks. And I'll just echo, um, I, I agree with everything that Mary just said. I, I think that the, the challengers here have reason to be optimistic um, that the New York law, at least in its current form, is not going to survive. But what happens after that, actually, I think, is that it's not necessarily an open question. But there, I think there's a lot of different ways the court could go here. And it was, I don't want to sound like I'm grading an oral argument, but it was a good oral argument in the sense that this really did seem like one where the justices were genuinely trying to puzzle yeah. through what would a constitutional permit regime look like. And um, the, the theme of discretion and too much discretion came up again and again and particularly seemed to bother Justice Kavanaugh, who may be in the sort of middle of the, of the votes here. Um, there are some, I think, like, I don't want to, Justice Leo and Justice Gorsuch, I just seem extremely skeptical. But aside from those votes, I think a lot of people were really just trying to figure out, like, what would it, what it would take to make a permit regime constitutional? And there are lots of different ways they can, they can look. I mean, we tend to think in three big categories of permitless carry, um, which was used to be rare. Used to, until 1987, there's just one state that had permitless carry. That was Vermont. Now there's 21. Um, shall issue states, which generally mean if you satisfy a sort of set of more or less objective criteria, then the licensing authority shall issue you a permit, so less discretion there. And then the may issue states like like New York, as as, as Jake was 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 describing earlier. The court certainly seems okay with, or seem to me to be okay with shall issue regime. So they're not, they're not. I don't foresee a a ruling that would say no more per, no more permit requirements are permissible. It's just a question of like what can you require, and stay within the bounds of the of the constitution. And just to amplify, like two more things that that, that Mary mentioned, and hopefully we can talk about more in the comments. Um, going along with this theme of the justices really seem to be puzzling through some hard questions. I would say that the theme of history and how to do historical analysis was certainly huge in the briefs. This is what the parties sort of their chosen terrain on which to argue this case. Um, there is, I, as I think Justice Breyer put it, this is a, was a wonderful case to show both sides of the history or something like that. I can't turn the camera around here, but I should acknowledge in the back of the room, uh, historian Patrick Charles, uh, who wrote a fantastic brief in this case, was actually called out um, by the justices, a reference to his brief. So it's wonderful to have you here, Patrick. Um, I think the justices were generally trying to like figure, figure that out uh, and what to do and asking hard questions about like, for example, 
how should we think historically about the sensitivity of a sensitive place like Times Square, for example? Do we do that by reasoning from analogy to history, or is there something more grounded in the social science um, that might get us there? And, and as I say that, I should point, again, I can't turn around, but to Kelly Roscom here from the Educational um, Fun, uh, Fun to Stop Gun Violence, I'm also involved in a fantastic um, set of briefing, not just in this case, um, but in, in, in general. So those are the themes I think we'll see in this case and, and others going forward that I think will be interesting to see how they pan out. Great. So um, I mentioned at the top that you both uh, uh, joined amicus briefs in this case. Can you briefly talk about uh, what you argued in those briefs and what from the oral arguments uh, related to or intersected with what you were arguing there? Yes, yeah, so the brief that we filed on behalf of uh, national, former national security officials, and I would note we actually had, I think, someone from pretty much every national security agency. So we had the entire intelligence community, including the former director of the, uh, the former director of national intelligence, CIA, NSA. We had Department of Defense, FBI, Department of Justice, um, State Department, Dep Department of Homeland Security, and. The, the theme here was that, look, um, concealable uh, firearms are a threat to national security. The ubiquity and easy access to firearms in the U.S. has been capitalized on by foreign terrorist organizations who actually, you know, recruit people to commit terrorist attacks in the U.S. by saying, this is so easy for you all. Just go, you can go get a firearm with almost... Uh, you know, almost no effort at all and committed an attack right there. And both Al-Qaeda Al has done that and so has ISIS. Um, and then we've actually seen some of the terrorist attacks by those who are pledging um, allegiance to foreign terrorist organizations. We've seen those committed with concealable firearms. I think a lot of people have a notion that every mass shooting is done with long guns, AR-15s, and sometimes those are in combination. But if you just think about the Pulse nightclub shooting, for example, right? There were he had handguns that he used in addition to his long guns. The recent um, uh, Saudi uh, pilot in Pensacola that attack handguns. Uh, and similarly, on the domestic extremist violence side, same thing. Dylan Roof, you know, not only was committed his slaughter of nine parishioners in Charleston, South Carolina, with a uh, handgun, but he concealed it in the Bible study group for a period of time while he attended this Bible study before he pulled it out and committed his mass shooting. Uh, Robert Bowers on the Tree of Life synagogue shooting also used concealable uh, handguns as well as as well as long guns. And so part of the point was to say the lethality of these guns is significant. 80% of the mass shootings um, in the U.S. are are committed with concealable guns, and the type of magazines you can attach to those um, make them extremely lethal. And just to kind of get that practical out of there, out there, we also wanted to send the message that any kind of expansive ruling that tied the hands of state and local officials when it comes to regulating public carrying of firearms presents a national security threat. And we emphasize there the rise of the unlawful private militia movement in this country and their heavy, taking up heavy arms, uh, as I said before, sometimes in opposition to government <coughs> policies with which they disagree. I mean, very notably uh, in 2020 against state governors issuing public health related uh, orders related to the pandemic, you know, storming capitals in Lansing, Michigan, Boise, Idaho, and elsewhere. But the insurrection on January 6th, we saw uh, militia groups, again, not with their long guns, because it's Washington, D.C., and they and, and you know there's no uh, public carrying of weapons, uh, open carrying of weapons here. But many of those had brought concealed, concealable weapons, and they had a plan for storing a cache of, of weapons outside the district in case they needed them. So part of the point here was to point out just from a totally policy practical point of view, we didn't make, set, you know, plenty of others were making the, the key Second Amendment arguments, but this practical point of view that there's got to be flexibility for um, state and local officials and federal officials to regulate care of, uh, the carrying of firearms, particularly in target-rich environments. And, and that's why I think I would see a little bit of an intersection with the argument. This, the, the, Extreme lethality didn't really get discussed much during the um, argument, but the vulnerability um, of sensitive places and particularly target-rich places was a large topic of discussion, as Joe was saying earlier. So 
uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist started it off, right, be saying, you know, could you bar guns in Asking Paul Clement, could you bar guns at universities? Mm -hmm. What about football stadiums? Uh, what about places where alcohol is sold? Um, Justice Barrett, you know, chimed in. Justice Kagan also on that. Like, what about Times Square on New Year's Eve? Uh, what you know, when? What about when people are drinking? We know when people are drinking, they often get angry, and when they get angry, they can do things crazy things if they have weapons. And so this led to a lot of discussion, I think. And I and I think this is an area, frankly, that is very, very important for there to be guidance for mm -hmm. uh, federal, state, and local officials going forward. There were analogies to time, place, and manner restrictions, which we, you know, that's a doctrine that is a, a First Amendment-based doctrine, which is, you know, you can, uh, when there's a substantial government interest, you can restrict speech um, uh, on a content-neutral basis, you know, based on time, place, and manner, uh, when there's a government interest. So. Um, I think we may see, uh, and, and there was, and that was actually even proposed by Paul Clement, as opposed to just a, a straight sensitive places um, type of policy, because that, of course, currently exists. We know that there are sensitive sensitive places where the Supreme Court has said long-standing regulations; it's okay under the Second Amendment to prohibit weapons in government buildings, etc. But this would be beyond that, right? Things like Times Square, things like the New York subway, things like football stadiums, and so that, at least in his mind, and I and, and I think you know maybe I, I can definitely see the analogy here would be more. Uh, amenable to time, place, and manner restrictions than just designating, because you can imagine New York City or Washington, D.C. kind of designating the whole place a, a sensitive place, which might go too far. So I think that's an area where the recognition of the lethality of uh, you know even concealable weapons is something that the judges will very much be thinking about, and we can come to the rural urban issue too in, in due course. But I wanna... well, I, and, and before I get to my brief, I just want to continue on what um, what Mary's just saying about sensitive places. So th this is this is a this, is a, this is phrase sensitive places comes from a, a really important passage in the Heller opinion, where Justice Scalia says that among other things, guns can be prohibited in sensitive places. He lists two schools and government buildings, um, and everybody seems, seems to just assume that is right. But there's not a lot in litigation or frankly in scholarship to kind of explain what makes those places sensitive and others not. There are not that many cases being litigated on the sort of, there was a reference at oral argument to sensitive places doctrine. I, I hardly even call it a doctrine. There, I mean, there's a couple cases. There's a big 10th Circuit case about post offices and post office parking lots. And there's a big case called Class about restricting guns on Capitol Hill or Capitol grounds. Um, uh, and, you know, th there's not that many more. Um, and, and, and it really did feel like after this probably 10 minutes of oral argument, devoted to hy hypos being thrown to Paul Clement, who's representing the challengers here, um, that really made me think, okay, if they do you know, pull back the, the ability of the state to issue these public permit requirements, it's going to greatly increase the pressure on sensitive places doctrine to develop and to have some kind of theory about what makes some places sensitive and others not. Maybe it's dangerousness. Maybe there's some importing from First Amendment doctrines like time, place, and manner, um, or like forum analysis. I mean, there's all these doctrinal tools the courts could use, but that has not, that has not until this point been the most active area, I would say, of Second Amendment law, uh, law and scholarship. And, and hopefully that's something we can come back to, because I think the, mm -hmm. the geographic line drawing issue, both for the sensitive places and for urban rural, really occupied a lot of the oral argument, yeah. uh, a lot of the oral argument time. Um, but if I can quickly say on, on, on the brief I filed, which actually kind of is a, I hadn't thought about it, it's a nice companion piece to, to Mary's, because whereas yours is focused so much on like the visceral and the practical and the in front of us costs of uh, potentially changing the constitutional rules. Mine, which I filed along with um, Daryl Miller, who is the faculty co-director of this center, and Eric Rubin, who's a law professor at SMU, is very much in the doctrinal sort of weeds. Like, what are the stakes here for changing the constitutional rules? So Jake mentioned this earlier, that one of the two big issues in Bruin is not just what happens with New York's law, but what does the Supreme Court tell lower courts about how they must analyze the constitutionality of gun laws going forward? There is currently in place what's often known as the two-part test or the two-part framework, um, which has been adopted by every federal court of appeals to approach the question as the dominant test in the more than now 1,500 or so Second Amendment cases decided since Heller. And con conveniently enough, for being called the two-part test, it has two parts. The first part, uh, uh, courts ask, does this challenged law infringe in any way on people, arms, or activities that are covered by the Second Amendment? Some things are simply not within the Second Amendment's ambit. According to Heller, people convicted of felonies, people adjudicated mentally 
ill, sensitive places, they just fall entirely off the island. The government can prohibit those things with no constitutional consequences, doesn't matter. Concealed carrying also, the court says, off the constitutional island. For those things that are, those things that trigger some kind of uh, Second Amendment coverage, then courts go to the second step where they apply some level of scrutiny the stringency of which tends to go up the more the law reaches gun possession in the home, which is close to what Heller dis, uh, uh, identified as the core interest of self-defense, which the court said is at its apex in the home. So the more you go into public, usually the less scrutiny that's, that's required. That's the existing framework. In our brief, we defend it against the alternative test, which has gotten some steam, um, mostly among conservative judges in dissents over the past few years, associated probably most closely with then-Judge Kavanaugh, who in a dissenting opinion in a case called Heller II advocated what he called the test of text, history, and tradition, which would say that gun laws should be evaluated solely by reference to those three things, or when they run out or are not available, analogies to those three things. And we think that's a bad way to do constitutional law. Um, uh, we think that he text, history, and tradition absolutely matter. They are a major part of the uh, two-part framework as it stands. Courts are already doing historical analysis, especially at the first step of the framework. But to make those the sole determinants of the constitutionality of contemporary gun laws, I think would be a mistake. Not because it would necessarily rule out gun regulation, because uh, there is in ample historical evidence to support a wide range of historical gun, a wide range of contemporary gun laws, but because almost all the work would be done by analogy and not in ways that frankly lend themselves to predictability or uh, for that matter, even sort of articulability. Uh, in fact, this was Justice Thomas's first question at oral argument, which I thought was a really interesting one. He asked to Paul Clement, the challenger, uh, the lawyer for the challengers, if we decide this case on the best of text, basis of text, history, and tradition, we're going to have to do it by analogizing what should, we should, do, what should we analogize to. And to me, that's that's where all the work is going to happen, and it's going to open the door to a lot of, I think, largely uncabined and probably unconscious judicial intuitionism about whether a particular gun or gun law is relevantly similar, is like a gun from the late 1700s or 1868 or whatever you want to pick your sort of historical year. I mean, Jake and I were at a, um, a, a firearms law um, um, uh, conference over the summer in Wyoming and had the opportunity to shoot black powder muskets, which was kind of an interesting <laughs> thing. But I can tell you, having shot one, it is a category difference from shooting a modern, any kind of weapon, let alone the AR-15s style weapons that um, uh, that Mary was just referring to. I don't know how to talk, think about those things as being analogous or not. I could say, well, I can lift them both, <laughs> but I couldn't even load a black powder musket without help. Most people don't think could, and it takes about a minute to reload it. That's a totally, to me, it's just a category difference. Um, so doesn't mean that modern weapons aren't covered by the Second Amendment, it just means that reasoning by analogy is probably not going to get you a good sort of predictable legal test for it. So our brief was an argument against the adoption of the text, history, and tradition test. Based on oral argument, I don't know <laughs> uh, if, if, the if the justices are on board with that. They clearly care a lot about the historical analysis. As I say, there's a way to do that within the existing framework. Hopefully, that's what they'll do. Uh, so let me ask you, um, Justice. So we had three different uh, attorneys up there arguing at the podium um, for the uh, over this case. Why do we have three different uh, lawyers up there arguing, and kind of what was the what were the nuances and what positions they were pushing? This is a really interesting question. So the challenge is represented by Paul Clement, um, legend of the Supreme Court bar, absolutely extraordinary attorney, um, and did a fantastic job as one would expect. Um, uh, he was representing the challengers, um, uh, th those those uh, challenging New York's law. So you know, team unity on that side. There's just one one <laughs> position, which is to try to get this law to try to get this law struck down. I think for for Clement, maybe the hardest moment to to me, and I'd be interested to see what what you all think was the sensitive places discussion um, when he was just peppered with a series of hypotheticals like, well, um, if uh, is this a sensitive place? Um, is this a sensitive place? Places that serve alcohol, football stadiums, NYU campus. Oh, NYU doesn't have yes, a campus. That's right. Well, Columbia then. I mean, there was a Two whole... Two minutes on that alone. Th there was an exchange literally about whether NYU has a campus. It was totally bizarre. Uh, we were all like scratching our heads on that one. Um, subways, et cetera, et cetera. And I was surprised by a couple things there. One, that he didn't concede more of them. I think I would have conceded yep. more of those to just say, yeah, subways, fine. Yeah, you know, NYU, of course, it's private. It can do what they want, um, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, his answer was, as I understood it, um, uh, I would need to see the history mm -hmm. on each of those things. And that, to me, is, again, a reason why not to adopt a purely historical test, because... 
you can just imagine the work uh, uh, that it would take for every district judge faced with one of these challenges to get the, what was it, 85 briefs in this case, 88, something like that, like to get that much briefing to know whether New York can keep guns out of bars or guns out of, you know, Yankee Stadium or whatever. Um, it, there's even, a, yeah, um, there's even a reference to Giant Stadium, which is not in New yep. York. <laughs> um, but in any event, like that, that doesn't, that to me doesn't seem like a good way to do constitutional law. I thought that was the sort of toughest moment for him. Um, rep defending the law, um, uh, uh, Solicitor General Barbara Underwood representing New York, and then Brian Fletcher representing um, the United States. Um, I, I th and I should say, I think this case was exceptionally well argued. Um, I thought uh, there were moments that were just truly, truly fantastic. Um, Brian Fletcher, I thought, had some moments that were just really exceptional. Um, um, General Underwood got pressed on um, you know, a lot of, I think, hard questions about uh, discretion in the law, um, about the use of history in the in the New York brief. Um, she had one interesting exchange with um, Justice Barrett, uh, who asked, um, do you think Heller was rightly decided? Which was not a question I expected mm -hmm. to come, because I thought everybody was sort of accepting we're in the Heller paradigm. Um, and then had a follow-up question, Justice Barrett did, and General Underwood said, as one should in that position, yes, um, I, I, this is arguing, I'm arguing within Heller. Um, uh, the follow-up question seemed to be, did Heller resolve all of this contested history in and of itself, such that we don't actually need to look at all the new historical evidence you've brought us. Heller as a, is a matter of precedent, not just with regard to the doctrine, but with regard to historical facts, which is sort of a, for a you know, law professor, an interesting and, and, and challenging question. Um, and then Brian Fletcher, I thought, was just remarkably able with the historical cases, the, the, the many, many state cases that you kind of keep straight in your head, and I think did a good job of sort of making clear that this is not a case that can be resolved by just saying there is a right to public carry, which is what I think Paul Clement was trying to suggest. What Brian Fletcher, I think, correctly said was, no, what they're asserting is a right to carry publicly without proper cause. That's the argument. That's the right they're claiming, which was a, a, a sort of maybe a subtle sounding move, but I think, a I think a really important one. Anyway, that's why there were three. The Solicitor General of the United States asked for oral argument time, got it, and that's what, why Fletcher was at the podium. Great, so um, one other thing that's noteworthy here is that this court has changed a lot since the court we saw in 2008 this, that decided Heller. I think only four justices remain on the court uh, that also uh, were there when the Heller decision was decided. Um, what did you make of the questioning, especially by the three newest justices, Justice uh, Neil Gorsuch, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and then this was our first chance to really see uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan also um, voicing their views on the Second Amendment. So what did we learn from these newer justices, um, and did anything stand out from you? Up so it's interesting because this kind of pulls up the, the point that was made earlier about Justice Kavanaugh and his dissent in Heller 2, which was, it, as it sounds, a post-Heller 1 case when uh, D.C. had adjusted its laws as it had to after the first Heller case, and, and then the, those laws were still challenged. And in his dissent, just exactly like Joe said, he, he said, I don't see anything in the Heller decision that would allow us to employ something like an intermediate scrutiny test. I'd see it as, as text, uh, history, and tradition, and you know, therefore that's what the test we should be using. I had thought, well, you know, he wrote that as though he was bound by that because that's what the Supreme Court has said. And I thought, who knows when he's on the Supreme Court, you know, they can do whatever they want. It was quite clear to me he still actually believes text history tradition <laughs> is the test. Uh, he didn't seem very open to some sort of level of scrutiny test. <clears throat> and I should just bookmark that most of the courts have applied an intermediate scrutiny, um, again, sort of with balancing things, depending on how close the regulation challenge gets to these core in the home uh, interests, the more scrutiny I think yeah. apply. Agreed. But Paul Clement did argue that if there was going to be a scrutiny test, it should be strict scrutiny. And I think that can't possibly be right. And I think Justice Kagan, at least maybe, was the one who sort of said, how could that be given all of the things that uh, you know, the Supreme Court has made clear are okay to regulate. Um, th that would almost defy from the beginning that there's anything like strict scrutiny applies. But anyway, putting that aside, um, Justice Kavanaugh uh, was often the one pushing on this notion of, um, uh, you know, how about the shall issue states, right? And so I feel like that might be a place where he feels comfortable. I don't think he's, he's definitely not comfortable with, you know, complete bans. Um, and, uh, but he, but, and, and, and I think licensing, he's 
comfortable with. The question is how much are we acquiring? And, and shall issue, as Joe mentioned is earlier, the kinds of requirements in the shall issue uh, states, if they meet them, you shall issue, are things like you don't have a criminal history, you know, those kind of, those kind of things, uh, the objective factors. Um, Justice Barrett, who had also dissented as a, you know, she's got such a short history as a judge, only on the Seventh Circuit for a couple of years, but during that period, she had issued a dissent in a challenge uh, brought by a convicted felon, but of a nonviolent felony, who was challenging the, res the, the inability to obtain, uh, to carry a weapon or obtain a license based on his, purely on his felon status when it was nonviolent felon. And she expressed a lot of skepticism about that, notwithstanding that Heller has called a longstanding regulation, you know, longstanding re regulations uh, can be upheld, that felons are, are barred from, may be barred from carrying firearms, uh, you know, uh, anywhere. Um, and what's interesting about that is, is I think she, in that dissent, um, uh, you know, also somewhat looked to history that felonies, now we have so many felonies that do apply to nonviolent things, and so that's maybe a little bit different than, than historical tradition. And also, I think was viewing things like where's your starting place when you're when you're talking about who can carry weapons. So she has some thoughts we know, knew about categories of people who can uh, be regulated, but that really wasn't what this case was about. What I did hear her saying, she she's the one who first brought up Times Square on mm -hmm. New Year's Eve. She's the one who made the comments about people drinking can get angry and when they have weapons, bad things happen. So I think she is concerned about a broad ruling that would um, hamstring of you know uh, local and state and federal governments from being able to regulate at least in sensitive places. The question is, what is that? Um, Gorsuch, you know, he participated remotely. He was uh, not feeling well. He didn't. He wasn't as active as I think he would have been if he'd have been in the courtroom. He seems. He seemed to be trying to, I think, pitch softballs to Paul Clement to the extent that he <laughs> did say anything. And I, I, you know, I think he's, but, but. So I didn't have the same sense. I mean, I can hypothesize just based on his general approach where he might land, but I didn't get a I didn't get a strong sense from his engagement mm -hmm. in where the line is for him. Um, other than other than what New York's doing is not okay. Um, uh, and then you know, I, uh, Sotomayor and Kagan, I think also you know everyone was very very concerned about the issue of how do you how do you protect uh, sensitive places and there were some interesting discussions as well and and Alita was part of this if i recall correctly about you know why uh, why in an urban area or a heavily populated area um it, it's more important to be able to prevent the type of um uh, you know, concealed carrying or have a higher standard for a, carrying a license there. And Barbara Underwood argued a couple of things. One, that, you know, when there's potentially a lot of people with firearms and they're concealed and, you know, something can break out, there's just the potential for, a, you know, a massive um, uh, deaths and injuries. And secondly, in urban areas, we have police, you know, modern police forces that are charged with, you um, you know, with protecting people, and so you don't, your need for self defense is not as great. And it was interesting because this didn't come exactly on the heels of that, but I think it was Justice Alito at some point, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, that it was him who said, but on the subway, if all kinds of non law abiding people mm -hmm. are carrying guns, um, and you know the police aren't there, uh, and the only people not carrying guns are the law abiding people, how is that? How does that? allow them the ability to protect themselves, you know, uh, to engage in self-defense. And um, I don't really even remember what the response was to that, but I, <laughs> but I think, uh, so anyway, he certainly was, was very skeptical, I think, of this sort of urban-rural mm -hmm. divide. And, and, and the chief was as well. Now, he, he was there during Heller, but the chief, you know, pose the question, well, how, how often do you even need a gun for self-defense in rural areas? How many muggings happened in rural areas? Uh, his view was, don't you need a gun for self-defense when you are in a highly 
populated area um, when you are more likely to be subjected to threats where you feel like you need to draw your weapon. I thought Barbara Underwood had a great response, which is, you know, we have, uh, you know, reported cases of, of rapes and robberies and violent crimes committed with guns on jogging trails and areas where, <clears throat> you know, where people aren't. And certainly for those of you who've been in Washington, D.C. for a while, we've had several pretty uh, horrendous murders that took place on on jogging trails so anyway I, I you know um i've probably digressed from your question <laughs> but right. it, it's always a it's always a bit of you know looking at a crystal ball mm -hmm. when we start trying to see where the justices are but my, my point is i don't think anybody well maybe maybe one or two would be ready to just say everybody can carry a gun everywhere but i don't think kavanaugh and barrett are there mm -hmm. at at all yeah. I'll just add to, uh, just a few very quick things on Barrett in particular. I mean, I thought her questions were among the most interesting and, and certainly incisive questions that we got at oral argument. Mm -hmm. um, and the sensitive places exchange is an example of that. Um, the case that um, uh, that Mary's referring to that um, Justice Barrett wrote a dissent in when she's on the Seventh Circuit is a case called Cantor, again, involving a, a nonviolent felon. And one of the things that, that then Judge Barrett said is, Prohibiting felons from possessing guns is okay basically because of their dangerousness, like when they are dangerous. That's the underlying principle. It's not whether or not you've been convicted of a felony. Some people have been convicted of felonies who are no physical danger to anybody else, right? The Martha Stewart being sort of the, the go-to example in this, <laughs> area, in this area. She's a convicted felon, not allowed to possess a gun under federal law. Is the world safer as a result? You know, maybe not. But... <laughs> But that same principle, I think, might be underlying Justice Barrett's approach to thinking about sensitive places. Because when she invoked Times Square, it wasn't to suggest, well, Times Square is the modern equivalent of the fairs and markets uh, in which guns would have been, or weapons even, would have been effectively prohibited under the statute of Northampton from the early 1300s. She wasn't saying it's because of his historical lineage, which would have been an easy enough argument. Um, yeah. It was because she said, these are places where lots of people are piled on top of one another, and there are lots of... You know, if you add, you know, tempers, booze, et cetera, things can go wrong pretty, pretty quickly. And if that's the operating principle, that could actually open the door to a lot of government regulation um, across, especially a, a packed urban area like uh, like New York. Um, and I think that leads to the to the urban rural divide uh, argument, which was a really interesting one. And here I should just, in the interest of full disclosure, say that I wrote an article years ago called Firearms Localism, arguing for exactly this, that there should treat gun laws differently in urban and rural areas, um, and uh, that we have done so historically. There's, you know, this is, pr this is before the test of text, history, and tradition, but it does slot nicely into that test um, uh, that we have traditionally regulated guns more stringently in urban areas than in rural areas, and the contemporary cost-benefit analysis supports that for, 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 for many reasons. What I did not anticipate uh, when I wrote the article or when oral arguments started is that Justice Thomas would be the most sympathetic, it mm -hmm. seemed like, of all the justices to that argument, um, uh, and came back to it again and again. Mm -hmm. That, you know, he's like, I presume, and in fact, it was, it was so much so that I didn't initially take, I did not initially understand that they were, I think, that they weren't hostile questions. They were, he really was trying to suggest to General Underwood, look, of course there's restrictions on hunting in Central Park, um, but not in, in Rensselaer County where these guys are from. Can't you do the same with you know, local tailoring of other kinds of gun restrictions? And I was like, yeah, 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 that's great. Um, let's, let's hear more of that. Justice Kagan, I think, came back to it. Justice Sotomayor, who said, yeah, the history's just different for the Second Amendment. Now, whether that accords with, and this is where I think that Chief Justice Roberts was concerned, he's like, but that's not how we think about constitutional rights, is it? They don't differ from place to place. And I wish I wish I'd heard a crisper answer on that um, because I think it's not the same as saying the right is different in different places. It's just acknowledging that the outcomes are just going to look different in places and uh, at different places. And that's true, for example, to go back to the First Amendment example, if you want a parade permit to, you know, uh, uh, have a parade and you want to shut down Fifth Avenue, it's going to be a lot harder than if you're trying to do it in Troy, which I think is the biggest town uh, up in upstate New York where they are. Not because the First Amendment's any different, but because there's just different considerations in those places and a lot of other people's interests at stake. Time, place, and manner, however you want to call it, the considerations just look different. And I think you could do the same. I have argued that you can do the same uh, for guns. Um, so, Mary, one of the things that you were um, uh, noticing earlier was that Justice Kavanaugh and a few of the other justices were concerned with the issue of discretion, how much this law gave discretion to local officials to decide whether or not the statutory standard was met. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, that focus on discretion and whether you think it's going to lead the justices to say any law that gives discretion to deny licenses to individuals would itself be unconstitutional, or is it just... Uh, this much discretion seemed too far for them. So I don't know the answer to that question, but um, because I couldn't really discern it and mm -hmm. nor, nor did I try. But, I, you know, what's troublesome here is the 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 proof of need required here is is in the statute 
pretty open-ended mm -hmm. and vague. So it's not like the statute said, here are the five factors that every licensing official should take into consideration in deciding whether a person has established proper cause um, for or you know a need for the ability to conceal carry. And I think it, you know, I think it would have been a very a different argument if the statute did have a multi-factor test. Um, because here, what has happened is that different jurisdictions have just sort of developed their own criteria. And uh, Barbara Underwood multiple times said those have also been developed through case law, cases where this has been challenged. And so courts have then tried to sort of set up what those criteria might be. New York has its own regulations with criteria. It's no question that in urban areas, they turn down more licenses than they, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that, because that's an issue they said, if you're really worried about this remand, because yep. we, you know, the way this came up on the challenge, we didn't build a record of, you know, how many applications there are and how many get turned down. There was a footnote in her brief that extrapolates based on some other statistics that the state collects that actually many, many licenses do get granted, and it's not like most don't, but I, but I don't have separate data for like New York City versus Rensselaer mm -hmm. County versus other counties there's no question that in in rural areas there the, the this how they apply the standard of proper need is much different than how it would be applied in New York City um, so I think the justices are uh, concerned about that maybe even some of the more progressive justices you know honestly and I think that um, I also personally thought Oh, you know, judge made law like ha, ha, that doesn't really give the applicant much yep. to go on when they're trying to figure out can I go get a concealed carry <laughs> license? They're supposed to do legal research and and figure out what court in their jurisdiction has said what. You know, that does doesn't really seem like a very readily administrable process. Um, so I, I, but what I don't know is will they say will they just say <laughs> look, having a requirement of need is just unconstitutional, shall issue is fine, but a requirement of need is unconstitutional, or say this particular construct gives too much discretion, too susceptible to being arbitrary or capricious. The chief, to go to Joe's point, you know, did say there is no other right that requires a proof of need before you get to assert that right. So he definitely, I think, would right. be against, you know, any type of proof of need. Um, and I will also say, Paul Clipant, one of the core features of his argument is that this proof of need meant that it is you have to be atypical in order to get a concealed carry permit. And his broader argument is that the Second Amendment amendment contains this right to carry a weapon outside the home. At first, I thought he was battling on something that really wasn't being questioned because neither the state nor the United States were arguing hard mm -hmm. that the Second Amendment doesn't protect a right to carry outside the home. The question is, what is the scope of that right? But he, he, was, he used that, I think, as a frame to say, when the restriction is, is so strict or applied so strictly, again, open question on really whether it is, that it's only if you are the atypical person that you can get a gun, then we know mm -hmm. the right has been, vi been violated. Right, I'd say uh, one of the things that was surprising to me from uh, Justice Kavanaugh asked this question, he said, was your central concern the discretion? And, and Paul Clement said, uh, two concerns. One is this discretion point, and the other is this atypicality yep. requirement. Um, I think Barbara Underwood tried to say it's not an atypicality requirement, it's a particularized requirement, um, but it seemed to still bother Paul Clement and then once he raised it to bother the other justices that there would be a special showing of need that someone requires, even apart from whether or not there are enough factors to guide an official in their decision making on that. Um, it was the showing that you had to be uh, different than, than uh, similarly situated New Yorker. But the particularized thing I thought was really interesting. I mean, and again, I think this is really hard in that moment that, that Mary's mentioning here where the chief justice was, I think, very sort of hostile to the idea that you would require a showing of anything in order to be able to exercise a right. I thought Brian Fletcher had the right answer to that. He's like th that is actually exactly what this right requires and always does. And frankly, that's how self-defense doctrine works. Like you have to show, you know, a particularized threat and historically you have to show necessity and proportionality of your response. Like it would be weird if a constitutional right, which is sort of like prophylactic to the underlying right of self-defense did not itself also have some kind of, or would, could not have some kind of particularized requirement. The question, the really hard one, I think, and, and I actually share exactly what Mary was saying, like some sense that maybe this New York law independent of this case 
could stand some <laughs> close looks, um, is just how far one can go with it. Yeah. And, and that's really, I think, where it's going to be challenging. I mean, even in a shall issue jurisdiction, I would assume if you go to pick up your permit, you check all the boxes, I'm not a convicted felon, I've never been adjudicated mentally ill, I'm not a fugitive from justice, the licensing agent says, okay, great, well, then I'm going to, and the person says, great, I can't wait because I need to take this and go buy a gun and rob a bank with it. <laughs> they won't give you your permit then, even though you satisfied all the requirements, right? Because you I don't, hope not. right, you don't have good cause, you don't have proper cause. And then maybe you say, oh, well, that's it's just because it's an illegal thing that the person wants to do. But that, again, is the question. Like, that's what New York is trying to prevent. And to me, that's where it just gets hard about, like, how stringent can you be in ruling some kinds of causes out? And it, it would be weird to me, I think, if just a person's individualized subjective fear is enough. I mean, the, the hard questions really came, and this is, there was an interesting exchange about this, about is the high crime areas. Yeah. Because that's, um, that's sort of the, almost the flip side of the sensitive places, if you like. Yep. And, and Justice Alito was very concerned about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, his very, I mean, he painted a dark vision yes. of working late in New York um, and of getting on the subway. And I think what he wanted to hear was that's would be good enough, a good enough cause. And I can imagine a world in which it is good enough cause. And I think Barbara, Barbara Underwood's answer was something like, well, if you say you want your gun, want a gun because you live in a high crime area, it kind of depends how big of an area you're talking about. It can't be, I want a high, I want a gun because I live in Chicago. Chicago has a lot of crime or you know, New York, even though New York looks better than Chicago in a, lot of different, in a lot of different metrics, it'd have to be like at the block level or something like that, a little more kind of narrow. And I think that's where the real hard mm -hmm. line drawing is. Mm -hmm. All right, let me ask one more question for you, Joseph, before I open up to uh, see if we have any questions here. Um, and it's <coughs> this notion of public carry, which, which contains both open carry and concealed carry. And the court restricted the, narrow the question presented in this case to whether or not the denial of the concealed carry permits to these petitioners violates the Second Amendment from what had been a proposed broader question presented of this question of public carry. Can you explain some of the nuances between public or between open and concealed carry and whether or not that seemed to matter uh, in the oral argument? I'll take the second part of that first. It did not seem to matter that much, which is interesting. Um, the, the, uh, but the hydraulics of the interaction between open and concealed carry, I think, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it did come up a little bit in oral, oral argument, especially when Justice Kagan was pressing Paul Clement uh, on the point. So, you know, th there are sort of, in general, two different ways to exercise the you know, ability to publicly carry a weapon, either openly, meaning it's not concealed, or concealed, meaning it is. And historically, concealed carry has been, in most parts of the country, strongly disfavored and often prohibited. And in Heller, it's specifically, the, Justice Scalia said, that's OK. The majority of 19th century courts to consider the question have said it's OK to prohibit concealed carry, meaning if they wanted to, states could totally forbid concealed carry. It would not trigger Second Amendment questions, right? But what about when they do that and also prohibit, as many states do now, or highly restrict, open carry? And then you're not left with any way to exercise the right to public carry. And that, as a policy matter, seems to be what many states prefer to do now, which is really restrict open carry or prohibit open carry, but allow some form of concealed carry with restrictions. I mean, that's New York, right? You cannot openly carry a handgun, but you can carry it concealed with the proper, with the proper permitting. The reason it's interesting, I, I think, is just that it's, a, it's sort of an interaction of maybe contemporary policy considerations and historical and doctrinal support that are almost inverted mm -hmm. from what you would find in a sort of historical model. And Justice Kagan was pressing Paul Clement on this. He's like, well, you're, you're actually arguing for essentially a constitutional right to get a permit to do a thing that you are not constitutionally entitled to do, which is concealed carry, precisely because New York has forbidden this other thing, open carry, which is not being challenged here. And isn't that kind of the flip side of what the history shows us? And Paul Clement essentially was, We'll take either one. We just need a way to exercise public carry, which I think is the right response um, if you just want a right to public carry. What's interesting to think through is just what a state or any jurisdiction like New York would do with that choice and what it would do to the gun debate if people in order to accept public carry had to accept open carry, you might see, I could imagine going in either direction, I could imagine a real spike in um, uh, pro-regulatory uh, uh, feeling if people had to actually be confronted physically you know, visibly with guns in public places. I could also imagine going the other way. I'm honestly not sure. But that's sort of how the hydraulics of those two things, I think, were, were interacting. We've seen it in other cases, too, including in the Ninth Circuit. Terrific. So let me open up and see if there are any questions from our audience here. Um, I have more questions for our panelists uh, if there aren't, but if there are, we want to give some time for that. We have a handheld mic that we can pass around if you do have any questions. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. <coughs> You'll say your name and then give your question. My name is Richard Feen, and the question I have is in regard to turn home. Is, uh, <laughs> 
There we go. The question is regard to corporations, whether they weighed in on this. And the reason I bring that up is I worked a corporate suite for a large home improvement company, and things change from state to state. And sometimes you go to another state, you see people with concealed weapons or unconcealed weapons, handguns, you know, just stuck in the anything from a purse, you know, into, into a belt. And so I'm wondering if they weighed in to some degree on this issue. Terrific, thanks. You wanna I don't you? know Sorry. the answer, so <laughs> probably so, because 88 something amicus briefs, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't remember actually whether there uh, were amicus briefs from large corporations. I know that there is a kind of debate going on in the corporate sphere and particularly um, in, in about 24 states now, um, the state legislatures are requiring businesses to allow guns on property and parking lots on their properties, it's called parking lot laws, and that that has faced a lot of backlash from the business community uh, who wants to be able to control uh, firearms on their own property. Uh, there has been um, a movement in some, uh, you know, some corporate organizations who say, we're gonna follow the locality's rules um, for our gun policies in our stores. So if the locality allows you to openly carry a firearm, we're going to allow that. If they allow you to conceal carry, we'll allow that. Others have said, um, we're just going to have a gun-free place. Others have said, we're going to request that customers not carry their guns, but not require that and not enforce um, any, kind of, um, any kind of rule on that. I think it's going to be one area that we'll see increasing tension, especially um, the state of Texas, for instance, has said, we're going to um, uh, restrict <clears throat> underwriting on state bonds to companies that do not have restrictive policies in their stores or with respect to um, organizations that they do business with. And so um, I think it's going to be a continuing area of, of, of clash, especially if the court goes the direction we think it's going to go in this case. But I'm not sure on this er issue in particular what kind of uh, what kind of corporate support there was for uh, either side. There was at least one brief, and I was trying to buy myself time to remember it. It came from like some businesses in the upper Midwest, and I wish I could remember what the umbrella mm. of it was in support of New York. And there may have been one in, in support on the, uh, of the challengers as well. Um, but, but to echo what Jake was saying, I mean, this is an area where partly, I think, because of the rollback of of state regulations, corporations and just I would say businesses generally have been, and private property owners generally have been sort of forced to confront the equivalent of these sensitive places questions for themselves, yeah. which you know is not, which you know one would think is just a straightforward matter of property law. You decide who comes onto your land or not, um, and if you want to have allow guns, great, and if you don't, great. Like and the you know the question about you know for example a lot of the questions about the sensitive places that we were mentioning earlier involve private. places that are private. Uh, you know NYU, Columbia, a lot of places that serve alcohol. Presumably, they're privately owned, and they can stadiums. Stadiums, right? Yankee Stadium, right? They can presumably do what they want to do. Um, but I think that kind of showed that the justices are recognizing that in the day, you know, where we live today, the equivalent of the fairs and markets from the Statute of Northampton from 1328 may be malls, or you know, or stadiums, or something else where. Private property owners, if they wish, theoretically can make their own choices. Now, as Jake says, that right to exclude gun owners is actually burdened um, uh, in some states and made made harder to exercise by parking lot laws, by signage requirements in Texas, for example. If you want to exclude gun owners from your um, from your premises, there's certain requirements about the signs; they have to be like so big or whatever, and that makes it a little harder, you know, to exercise the right. It's not making it impermissible. Gun owners have challenged some of these laws, um, including a, a big 11th Circuit case called GeorgiaCarry.org, uh, essentially challenging challenging a law which gave churches the power to say no, or churches and others, the power to say no to having gun owners on their property. Um, uh, that was challenged as a viol violation of the Second Amendment and the Eleventh Circuit, I think, quite appropriately. In an opinion by Duke alum Jerry Choflat, actually, um, uh, wrote uh, that that is the, 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 the private property right overrides whatever you know, right, a, a gun owner might uh, might have to carry a gun publicly. So anyway, some general thoughts here. One last one is that we have also seen in recent years, you know, um, uh, some companies involved in the selling of guns opting out uh, in various ways of we're not going to sell this kind of gun or in this particular place, which again is a way to kind of like, you know, exercise the, the power that private, private businesses have. Terrific. Did I see another hand? Gotcha. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, Patrick Charles. Uh, the more I read um, or listen to the oral arguments, I see a chance for a plurality. Um, and in, in a, here's, here's my scenario to see if you guys think it is plausible that the law is struck down um, in part by text history tradition, you'll have that contingent, but ultimately the two step survives because two or one of the justices that strikes it down says, no, I, I prefer this way and here's how the law is struck down. Do you see that as a, as a plausible way that it survives? If, but I don't know how that works with the dissent. You have to dissent to keep the two step test, but I'm just curious of, of your thoughts. 
I would say um, I, this is this is uh, even having reread re the transcript and have had a lot of time to think about it, so I shouldn't be stumped by the question. This is one. It actually is. Really, it's hard for me to count to five. Yeah. It's harder than most because the the themes and this has come out. I think in some of our discussion today, this wasn't a simple pro con oral argument yeah. like you know yes no I like guns or I like the permitting requirement. It was really trying to tease out challenges totally. of history of sensitive places of urban rural divide of discretion like you know that I've said this before but it really was like in Heller the villain was very clearly like the home invader mm -hmm. in this case there was a new villain which is this this like this this you know apparently omnipotent like licensing authority right. exercising like <laughs> tyrannical discretion like the justices were really and maybe appropriately like upset with that and I don't how the dust settles on that is a little hard for me to see I mean I can see three I would say confidently, it seems that Kagan, Sotomayor, and Breyer will vote to uphold this law. I think in its, they would be happy with it in its current forms. I think I'd put those three on one side. I think there's a little that I could, I could imagine convincing Justice Alito, who's, who's I mean, irate uh, at the oral yeah. argument. It was yeah. really, it was really something else. But the rest, it's really hard for me to predict. Um, you know, I can, I can see. A, a sort of geographically tailored kind of approach, winning support from Thomas. Um, as I said, he seemed very sympathetic to that approach. Um, maybe then the chief and or and Barrett, you know, given her, and so then they, then you've got five maybe for some kind of geographically, which would be an interesting lineup if mm -hmm. it's if it were Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, Barrett, and Thomas. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting lineup, um, uh, but I could see splinters in all kinds of different directions. I think basically what you've got in the middle, as I see it, is Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Barrett have kind of, they could kind of move in different directions, and Thomas, and Thomas. maybe on some of these issues. It's, it, it's, yeah. I've made it sound even muddier, but uh, I would say yes, I can, I can see a plurality opinion. I can see lots of different lineups. I'm not sure which one. Because I think the test is, to, it, if it gets straight to your question about, you know, is it going to be just text history tradition or the two part? Mm -hmm. I. I I don't think there's going to be five that agree to to one of those. I mean, I could be wrong, but I so I think you could be right that we we still won't come out with a <laughs> with a really good test. One of the things that this makes me think about that we haven't really talked about at all is just I was I was surprised and Patrick, you know, you wrote a historian's brief like how little history uh, how little time history took up in the argument because it was a massive mm. amount of the briefing, the, the party's briefing. I mean, Paul Clement's brief, Barbara Underwood's brief, the U.S. Yeah. government's brief. And the history, you know, I, I think anyone can can make an argument about the history that supports their argument. Um, uh, and that's exactly what their parties are doing. And I think that could be why we didn't see as much argument time spent on it because maybe the justices themselves realized how manipulable the history was and wasn't going to give them a clear answer on some of their questions, although that certainly doesn't stop some of these justices in, <laughs> in other situations. But, you know, if you just look, if you just look at, at history, you know, just if, at a high level of generality, it's crystal clear across the board there, ha there have been regulations of guns in public for, you know, since the 1300s. And then the, everything breaks down in what were they regulating and was it only when they're going armed to the terror of the people, which is what Paul Clement argued, or was it anytime you're in a, a public place with a densely populated like a market or fair like Barbara Underwood uh, uh, argued. So I, I was just surprised given the amount of ink spilled on history, how little actual argument time there was. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't think that you won't have judges, uh, justices, at least Kevin, us saying text history and tradition is our test. There's also a question when it comes to history about, you know, what, how far back, do, do, you know, do we have to look at the history or maybe really conversely, how recent does, is, is the history relevant and what does tradition mean? How far back do we yeah. look at tradition and how recent does, does, um, uh, you know, tradition extend? And the other thing that didn't come up, it wasn't really at issue here, um, in the actual question presented, but you know, there's another very important issue out there when it comes to gun regulation, which is the type of gun, right? Yeah. And and you know, we could, there could have been more discussion about that because even though we were talking about a concealed carry permit and that had you know has certain you know size restrictions to it, there's still all kinds of guns that fit within that size description, and there really you know that really wasn't argued um, at all. And I would just note one concern I always have with. Um, the construct and heller of you know the, the weapons that are protected are those that are sort of like in common and general use. There's a point that 
Justice Kavanaugh made in his Heller 2 dissent, which was that essentially, you know, assault style rifles are now in common use. Yeah. And so if common use just means because we have such lax gun laws in this country that, you know, if, if, if everybody started machine guns, would start buying machine guns, would that be in common use? So I think this is another area not touched by this case that is has enormous, um, you know, consequences going forward. I just want to amplify one of the things that, that, that Mary said that's really important and goes to your question, Patrick, is one thing that was different about the historical arguments here or even the background of the briefing and in Heller is that here you have Heller. Like Heller's yeah. been decided. And so there is the, there was this sort of theme of like, well, how much do we have to do this or how much does Heller resolve this? And I mentioned this earlier with Barrett's comment, but you saw it too with some of Clement trying to dismiss like mm -hmm. entire eras of cases. <laughs> you know, like, well, in the late 1800s, the whole, you know, militia-based view of the Second Amendment was taking hold. So you got to disregard those cases. And it's like a, a continuing trimming of history yeah. and sort of, you know, and uh, Heller decided this and the, thus any cases that upheld gun laws, if those cases additionally, maybe not as a basis, but additionally adopted a view that the Second Amendment is about the militia. You can't read those cases, right? Okay, well now we've started to distill the history down into a more and more and more gun rights protective sort of vision. If we keep going down that route, um, then you know I think the ratchet is just going to keep yeah. keep going because history will just keep getting pushed kind of off the table. And that that was an interesting, again, like I think as Mary says, absolutely. We did not see a lot of debate about Rex v. Knight and right. things that you've written and others have written on. We did see some general like statements and sort of assumptions about the history from both sides. Yeah, I think that was one of the uh, surprising things was that this statute in Northampton from 1328, it might be surprising to all of you that we're talking about it so much. They take up a lot of room in the gun debates and it wasn't raised at oral argument until Justice Gorsuch yeah. in his questioning time yeah. at the very end um, of, of Paul it. Clement said, yeah. we haven't talked about the statute in Northampton and what do you have to say about that? Um, that was almost literally the question. It was, it was not a pointed question. It was just. Yes. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, and the other thing I would say to your question in particular is that one of the things that Paul Clement said uh, toward the end of his argument was, um, look, you don't actually have to adopt a test for this case. You can actually just do what you did in Heller and say, this law is too far and uh, we'll figure out another day what we're going to do with how courts should evaluate challenges. I think that would be very unsatisfactory to lower courts in particular who have been searching around for the last 12 years about how they should decide cases and have adopted uniformly this two-part framework. If they were going to apply that for 10 more years and then 20 years down the line, the Supreme Court says, actually, we're going to adopt a different test. I think that would be very um, unsatisfactory. Um, and and that uh, most gun rights supporters who are not representing clients before the court, like Paul Clement, actually want some guidance um, and want the court to adopt a certain test that lower courts should apply. But I, I think, you know, given the split that we see, and maybe it's unlikely that they're going to be able to adopt the test, but there will be a majority to say this law is unconstitutional. Maybe we come out of this uh, case without without one, or maybe that is a direction that pushes some of the justices to compromise in ways they maybe wouldn't have normally because they actually want to give guidance to the lower courts. All right, any other um, questions? I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Is this on? <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Kelly Roscom. Um, I'm with the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. Um, I wanted to ask, because it was sort of the, the specter of the oral argument, but never quite said out loud, which is that there seem to be, at least among many of the justices, concerns that people with guns do kill and injure a lot of individuals every year. Um, and to that extent, what would a different test, something other than the two-part test, how would that take into account this public health data regarding um, dangerousness of individuals with firearms, the efficacy of certain firearms regulations? Um, would that work somewhere into analogizing through history the purpose of historical regulations? Um, and uh, you know, how, how different would that be then from mm -hmm. the two-part test? This is, this is an excellent question, um, Kelly, and, I, and maybe I'll start on it because this was sort of the, uh, one of the things that we were trying to address in our brief. And, and maybe I'll first say that to our point about history at oral argument, I thought social science did not get its full due uh, at oral argument. There were some general sort of, you know, statements made mostly by Paul Clement that all we want is to do what these 43 other states do, meaning those states with shall issue or permitless carry, and they've not had problems. Therefore, New York would kind of be the same. And that's a, that's a moment when if you're in the social science debate, you, you do have the sort of tendency to want to jump up on a chair and be like, 
there's tons of studies that show exactly the opposite of that. Now there's studies on both sides, but it's certainly not true to just say like, oh, there have not been, you know, there have not been 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 bad impacts. I mean, you just pick off the top of the stack. John Donahue studies Missouri's, you know, loosening of its permit requirement. What happened? Violent crime went up 10 to 15 percent in the next few years. I mean, there's lots of data on there. So I don't think social science got its due at oral argument. Would it get its due if the court were to adopt a purely historical um, test? This is a, one of the things that I'm primarily concerned about. I mean, evidence-based, the Second Amendment should leave room for evidence-based policy, is my view. That's how other constitutional rights work. I should maybe make this clear that other than arguably the Seventh Amendment, we have no other amendment that is this, the, whose bounds, meets and bounds are set out purely based on text, history, and tradition. This would be unique, so it's a little bit of, you know, terra incognita here. But my guess is exactly what I think you suggested there, Kelly, which is that it's going to come in one way or another in the way that judges analogize, analogize across time. Like if a, if a judge is faced with a challenge to the constitutionality of the current federal law that prohibits gun possession by people convicted of crimes of domestic violence, they're not just going to look back to 1791 and say, well, domestic violence wasn't even prosecuted as a crime. Therefore, there's no historical basis for this law. Therefore, it's unconstitutional to deny guns to abusers. They're not going to do that because it's insane because people who, I mean, but literally, this is like, a, Leading, leading cause of homicide death for women in this country is, uh, is gun homicide by intimate partners. Judges are not going to strike that law down. They'll find some way. And I think it'll probably be by abstracting up, as Justice Barrett did at oral argument, to, okay, what we take from the history is dangerous people can be prohibited from having guns. People who have been convicted of crimes of domestic violence are dangerous, you know, ipso facto, they can be denied guns. I'm I would be fine with that. I just think that's what the tiers of scrutiny do. That's what the current framework does. And there's no reason to call it a test of pure text, history, and tradition when you're just opening up the door for p other people to make kind of different determinations. But that, that to answer your question, I think that's how it would come in. I don't think social science totally be dis will disappear. It's just going to get smuggled in in, a kind of, in kind of odd ways, in unpredictable ways. And I agree with that and go back to what you said earlier that Justice Thomas's very first question is, you know, what do we analogize to? And I think Paul Clement said sensitive locations. Yeah. I think that that's, that's what started his, that whole that's what started the whole sensitive location um, <clears throat> debate. But uh, I agree. It'll come in some way. And I think it'll look at things like dangerousness and and sensitive locations because they become more dangerous when you have people for all these reasons we've been talking about. Maybe they're drinking, maybe they're in compact, you know, environments and we can go back to the bans on, you know, bringing guns to the markets and fairs and say this is steeped in it. And the reason for that was because of the danger when you had that many people together. And um, uh, it's very imperfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, I would just echo that, which is to say, I think it might come in and attest on text, history, and tradition in uh, the government having to put forward evidence to show that a person satisfies a historical category like dangerous people. And so we would see the same type of analysis being done, except for the court's not asking the question of whether or not this law is tailored enough to meet the government's ends, but asking whether or not the government has enough evidence to show the person is in this category of being dangerous. And whether that's analytically different or not, I think is an open question. Uh, I did see one last question back here. No, all right. Um, so terrific, thank you all for being here. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Uh, right, we do have um, uh, boxed lunches to take to go. Um, I also just heard that the rooftop is open and it's a very, apparently a very lovely place. So if you want, you can take your lunches up to the rooftop and stick around. We'll be around for a little bit. Um, to get there, you have to go down to the lobby, take the elevators on the other side up to the 11th floor or the top floor, whatever it is, um, for the rooftop. Otherwise, take a lunch and, and feel free to go. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it.